Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. This time on Voice of the Sea, UH Sea Grant's Kevin Hopkins experiments with sturgeon farming and aquaculture in Hilo. So tell me a little bit about these fish, um, sort of in terms of their physiology, what is unique about okay. a sturgeon? Okay, the, uh, the Siberian sturgeon, they basically are purely a freshwater fish. The uh, Russian sturgeon that we do work with normally, they are a, uh, what we call a, anadromous fish. Okay. It means that the, uh, they spawn in fresh water, uh -huh. go out to sea to grow up, and then come back in uh, with and that one. Now, they don't, these, they don't go to sea, but they go to brackish fish. The ones we work with normally are in either the Caspian Sea or the Black Sea, and they stay in the estuarian areas. And uh, they, and the Caspian, they'll be at about, oh, 10 parts per thousand, which is just about one-third salinity of the ocean. Okay. And so... They work really well, actually, down at our farm in Kelkaha, where we were taking pictures yesterday. But uh, they've been moved back over here because we were having some problems with the pump. The Siberians, they're a smaller fish, uh, and they're a lot stockier fish. The Russians are uh, longer, more elongated fish, much more heavily armored. These guys look like here, as you can see, some of, some of them here almost look like fat little pigs that swim, swim around in the water. Uh -huh. uh, um, I always hear caviar and sturgeon okay. associated with caviar. Okay, yeah. Now, the Siberians will give us caviar right at five years old or maybe six. The Russians, about eight. Now, what happens in culture is they give it to, we're getting this, this is considerably earlier than it happened in nature. Oh, wow. So, what happens in nature is typically they would mature at about 13 years of, 13 to 15 years of age at about 15 kilos in about 30 pounds. Uh, now what we get them to do is we get them to mature at eight years of age and they'll be at 30 kilograms, which is you know twice the size. They'll be twice the size, but half the age. Right. Because they, and the main reasons they do that here is in nature, they have cold winters, but here we have, um, you know, it's constant temperature year round. Now our problem with them, with the, what we have with our fish here, and it's one of our things that we're having a difficulty with going forward with it, is we have what they call asynchronous maturation. Because we don't have a winter to sort of get everybody on the same cycle, uh -huh. breeding cycle, is we get them coming uh, mature at different times and they become ripe at different times during the year. And so, uh, and because we don't have that many fish, it's hard for us to, to find the ones that are mature. And the, one of the other things that is a real problem for us is we cannot tell just by looking at them what's a male and what's a female. Oh, wow. So uh, when they're real mature, you can tell because we can use ultrasound at that point. But when they're not real mature, uh, it doesn't work. And so you're getting the eggs, the caviar off the females. Um, yeah, we've done it. We've made caviar once. Oh. That was about five or six years, about five years ago. So mostly in terms of um, an economic process, you're looking at the sturgeon meat rather than the caviar. Well, actually what we're looking at is a combination. Because we can't wait eight years to get economic viability, we're looking at that. We'll grow them to two to three years old, harvest out the bulk of the fish, keep the biggest ones, which were in all probability, although we're not certain, are females. Uh -huh. The vast majority of them are going to be females. And then at five years of age, we'll actually check them. And actually, the way we have to check them is we actually have to make a little slit in them. And we either take a sample of the gonad or we'll put in uh, an endoscope. You know, the things that, you know, that uh -huh. you start doing surgery with inside people's bellies. A little camera and go inside right. the and, surgeon and, and, and take a look. So these guys, you grew them from eggs? Yeah, we get our, right now we get our eggs from a farm in uh, Italy. Our first stock came in from a commercial farm in Russia. Now, would you be able to use your own stock to produce eggs? We could, and that's, but you know, this asynchronous maturation is a problem for us. Actually, we would prefer not doing that because a, a mature fish is going to give us 500,000 or more eggs, and we don't need that many. We only need like 50,000 <laughs> to keep the industry going because we're small scale. Uh -huh. And where we're at right now with this, all of this work here is done in cooperation with the private sector. 
who basically cover all of the out-of-pocket expenses uh -huh. for this. So when the fish are imported, the private sector company pays for all the expenses on that. So if something goes wrong, they eat it. <laughs> and we have had initially about every three out of four shipments would go wrong. Oh, we're, wow. at the, we're at the farthest range that we can do for shipping them. And so that means and that was like $5,000 a time. So each time that it would go wrong, they'd lose $5,000 and they just were accepting that loss. They grumbled, <laughs> <laughs> but we did that there. And so now we actually have, we know how to ship them in. That's been one of the big things here. Our big ones were people thought we couldn't get them here alive because uh -huh. we're at the, how far away we are. We now have the techniques worked out to get them alive. People thought that they wouldn't grow here. We've shown that they'd grow. People thought they wouldn't mature here. We've had both collected sperm, that's, you know, swimming sperm, and we've collected the eggs. In fact, the eggs have been made into caviar, so we've got that. People said, oh, well, the market isn't going to like it. We've done the market test with some of the fanciest restaurants in the state. Alan Wong has been fantastic for us. <laughs> uh, and it, we've actually won, uh, we were, he, every quarter he has what's called the Farmer Series dinners where he highlights the farm and we so we were the highlighted farm of, uh, last year and what is the sturgeon meat taste like i've never uh had well before. for us it's a very mild white meat but it's relatively firm it's much more solid uh from my perspective it tastes somewhat like moi okay which is probably has to do with that we feed the same diet to the sturgeon that is fed to the moi <laughs> But it's, you know, moi is a small fish and, you know, uh -huh. a very, uh, so, rel relatively soft. This is actually uh, a thing, so you'll see the nice solid fillets that we have. And I've been doing this, working with uh, aquaculture for almost 40 years now. I started in aquaculture in 72. Oh my goodness. And uh, it wasn't what my, my interest was. I, I landed up in aquaculture. I actually have a degree in zoology. And I put myself through school by working in a fisheries laboratory. So I was interested in fisheries. But the, uh, at, the, at that point in time, I decided to, I managed to beat the draft with a high draft number. And then I said, well, I still felt like I needed to do public service. So I signed up for Peace Corps. Oh. So I went into the Peace Corps and they assigned me to, a, to aquaculture. My family was, I was the first one in my family to go to college. And so we really didn't quite have the uh, resources. I was accepted both in Miami and in uh, San Diego. And so, but we just didn't have the resources to go. So I landed up going to the University of Oklahoma. Oh. So that's why I landed up doing zoology instead and working in the fisheries lab. And then, then I got sent to the Philippines and they said, we want you to do aquaculture. We we're always recycling things. Uh -huh. And as if you can take a look over here, we recycle shipping containers and because the shipping containers are right here what you can see with oh, them uh, sure. like number three uh, so like here here they make fantastic uh, wow. temperature uh, light uh, these are environmental control chambers and so you can have a bunch of them side by side and yeah we, we have 11 of them run different experiments yeah run different thing. experiments all on this with and this system here is set up as recirculation, so this is all filters over here. And so we have 15 tanks that we can do here. The tank down at the end is for salt water, but we can control the light, we can control the temperature, uh, getting this, so we have different, and they're set up with different types of things. So here we have, these are aquariums. This room is just all feed freezers, because it's really cheap for us to, just the air conditioner and keep it really cool right here, uh -huh. so our feed, stays in really good shape. So this is all our feed in here. And by us locking it up like this here, we don't have to worry about rodents or other vermin that get in there. And, and so- It's very cold in there. Yeah, it is, <laughs> it is cold in, in there. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, this one's set up. So here's six tanks. Oh, and what are in these? Uh, tilapia and these guys on this side, uh, these, are, uh, these are sword tails. And what are sword tails, I know? Sword tails are a, uh, it's an aquarium fish. Uh-huh. What we really like about these containers are we just dump water on the floors and we just have drains cut at the end and just 
suit real simple so it doesn't mean we need to drain, run drain lines or anything. Uh, clean them up real quick. Things spill out over here. We just deal with them. This is another one. This is actually a hatchery container. This is where, our, where we usually set up our, all of our hatchery systems. Uh, right now we have some extra tilapia. They're just thrown in here just to be, we're maintaining them. We have multiple types of hatching systems that we teach for the students. So that's like the hatching system is typically used for salmon eggs, uh, but we can use it for other things too. We have different types of hatching jars. So it's also, we have jar, two different designs for jars. One's an upflow jar, another one's a downflow jar. We have that. So, and again, all the students are, we expect them, you know, they take the labs, they have to learn how to do that. And all of our aquaculture students are required a 300 hour, what we call directed work experience. Uh -huh. They have to work 300 hours actually doing, you know, aquaculture, you know, agriculture related jobs. Wow. If they don't do, you know, that's a requirement for graduation. So when they finish the program, then they're ready to go. Yeah, work. we, you know, we have students, when they get out of here, they're ready to go to work on farms. Some of them go to graduate school. Some of them uh, build, get their own farms. Some of them go work for, for industry, you know, the uh, uh, supply industry. And so, like, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our graduates is, a, uh, is the marketing manager for the largest aquaculture supply company in the United States. So, having worked in aquaculture for the last 30, 40 years, what do you see as one of the things that you'd like to, to have happen in the industry? Here in the United States, we are so well fed in everything else that we don't realize what the rest of the world is really like and that how precarious the food situation is in most of the world. The estimates are, even though we have 7 billion people now, and by 2050 we're going to be up to 9 billion people. Now, they say, okay, so we're going to have to go up two sevens, you know, 30%. But the reality is everybody's expectations for food and what they want are going up at the same time as they develop. The estimates are that we're going to need to double food production in the next 40 years. There's not enough arable land or fresh water to do it. The only way we can do it is to go to the oceans. Now we've got to figure out how to go to the oceans to do it sustainably and basically using the photosynthetic productivity of the oceans. So it's it's called on a thing a marine agronomy. Now most people, do, agronomy is like growing crops, uh -huh. big crops. So we're going to have to look at doing that in the ocean because it's not going to happen on land. What we have on land and getting much more efficient on land is going to be really important. It's going to be a major contributor. It's not going to be enough. Aquaculture has some great potential, but where I'm thinking it's going to be is it's going to be in seaweeds. We have to find out how to grow the proper seaweeds and grow fish that like to eat seaweeds better and move them into the markets because and whether we are in 50 years from now, whether we are eating top of the line things like bluefin tuna or these other ones there, I don't know because I know we do have restaurants out there where people eat bears and they eat lion and these other ones there. But I think that, you know, it's not going to reach that point, but it's going to be really highly restricted on what these top of the line predators that we can eat. and. Uh, we're gonna to have to look to feeding the people. And so by eating more of these herbivorous or vegetarian fish, we'll be eating lower on the food chain. Right, yeah. And so like tilapia do feed very low on the food chain. Most fisheries in the world are overfished, okay? And what we should really be doing is not fishing them and letting them recover. Very easy for me to sit there in the ivory tower that I live in and say that. Now I've actually worked out in the real world. I've worked in areas where where people are, you know, that far away from starvation. And I've, I've worked in areas where people are, you know, where part of the population is dying of food-related diseases and things like that. You know, it's real hard for me to sit to, oh, you can't do that because I want to protect the fish, you know. Uh, and I really wish that some of, the, some of our do-gooders would out there and say, okay, you know, you go out there and tell that person that his kid's got to die. But then bringing a system like aquaculture to that area can provide... Right, well, bringing, it in, bringing aquaculture into that area helps. Uh, aquaculture is one of the things, uh, one of the things which we have with fisheries, 
And one of the big problems we have with fishery, particularly in the, many of the developing countries, is that fishing is the last resort of the, of the poorest of the poor. So do they even have the assets to do it? And so we have people who talk great about it, spend millions of dollars attacking the aquaculture industry and saying we should do it better and everything else. You know, if they just put some of that money actually out there helping develop sustainable aquaculture, we'd be doing a whole hell of a lot better than using it to raise millions of dollars more, which they could use for advertising, to get more money to use for advertising. You know, so I'm sorry if I sound cynical, but I am. And, uh, and I get real irritated with people who are holier than thou. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG has been providing quality educational programs and services for over 40 years, serving students, teachers, parents, educators, and experts around the world and here in Hawaii. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA.